So thank you very much for the introduction. I do work for Atkins Realis. My name's Luke Johnstone. Today I'll be presenting Quantifying a Conceptual Model, a case study on total geological history. Now, this case study focuses on my 2021 paper, Differentiating Fill and Natural Soft Clays, the Value of a Desktop Study in Building a Geological Model. And before I get stuck in, I'd like to thank my co-author, Sergei Tizagi, the colleagues I worked with with Arab on the project, the Australian Geomechanics Society, and of course, the Geological Society and Associated Staff for having me here tonight. And this is the next one. There we go. So we'll start off by setting the scene, discussing total geological history, the legacy of Peter Fuchs, and its place in our industry. We'll then step into our case study, describing the site, its problems, then its history, and geological and human timescales, how we used a specialized additional ground investigation we scoped to build a preliminary model, the problems we had with this model, how we refined it with our understanding of the site history, the desktop study, how we verified it with behavior, and it'll close with some discussion points that I hope we can all take back to our day-to-day -day work. To start off by setting the scene, the unknown between our boreholes, what we do as engineering geologists, geotechnical engineers, and geoscientists is quantify and classify the ground conditions. As a result, one of the key risks in the work we do is something unexpected. We, sorry, we formalize this understanding into geological models, tables of parameters, lists of risks. And as a result, one of the key risks that we face is something unexpected. Shallow rock, we're expecting deep, or deep rock, we're expecting shallow. To reduce this risk, we study all the available, available information. We go out, we study, we do desktop studies, we go out and do des uh, ground investigations to get a glimpse into the subsurface. But there's always going to be a gap between our boreholes. We can't see what's here, we can't see what could be here, and it's an infinite range of unknown unknowns. And as much as we'd like to do, do boreholes across every centimeter of our site, we can't. So how do we turn these unknown unknowns into known unknowns? A range of quantifiable conditions, potential conditions we may encounter on our site. Peter Fuchs, as one of his defining works, one of his many legacies, created a framework for doing exactly this, coined total geological history. And it's exactly what it says on the can. It's a focus on the history of the site and works by building a series of conceptual models, starting off on a massive scale. Conceptual models spanning geological timescales, rock forming processes, tectonic plates, then iteratively narrowing down to the site scale, creating conceptual models which focus on the recent history, geomorphological processes, the human influence on the site, this series of geological models, ge uh, conceptual models, informs a range of processes and potential conditions that we can encounter. This range of potential conditions informs that blank space between our boreholes. So with this in mind, with a focus on site history and the total geological framework in mind, we'll step into our case study. Our case study is a residential development in Harborside, Sydney. The development and the surrounding land, surrounding suburbs, overlies reclaimed land, which as the project team, we described to the client as pea soup. The surrounding suburb had a number of settlement issues associated with this pea soup. Facades and roads cracking, culverts settling and needing to be realigned, and it drove careful consideration of soft sediments on this project. So this, the development itself, as you can see from my excellent sketch there, piled through to bedrock, isn't really susceptible to these settlements. However, the associated works, the utilities, the access roads, car parks, basements, all of this sat directly on the pea soup and was highly susceptible to settlement. Now, myself and Ara became engaged in this project in 2021, and the first thing we did was conduct a detailed desktop study. This desktop study, of course, started off at a massive scale, spanning tectonic plates and geological timescales, but we'll pick it up for concise sake at the bedrock. The bedrock of this site, and what underlies the majority of the Sydney area, is the Hawkesbury sandstone. This is a middle tertiary rock deposited uh, in the Triassic through geological timescales. It was buried, lithified, then uplifted, and deeply incised by a set of rivers um, into drowned river valley systems. The Sydney Harbour is one of these drowned river valley systems. And our case study sort of takes place, I can't share the exact location of the site, but in that figure on the right-hand side, it's somewhere in the top right corner. On the left-hand side, we see a seismic line running through the Sydney Harbour that's roughly underneath the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which shows a series of infilling Holocene and Pleistocene sediments, and on the right-hand side is an artist's impression of what the Sydney Harbour would look like, this drowned river valley system, without all of the infilling sediments and infilling water. Sort of a, a mess of format. The first deposit to form within this drowned river valley system is a Pleistocene clay. 
This is quite distinct. You can see a clip on the right hand side. It's a gray, orange, high plasticity, very stiff. The second deposit to form, once again, very distinct from the underlying material, is a Holocene estuarine clay. Now, following the last glacial maximum, as the start of the Holocene, sea levels lowered, fluvial processes reactivated, incising the top of the Pleistocene clays, and these were deposited in an estuarine environment. These are dark gray clay, typically uh, very soft, organic component, trace shells, uh, and sand lenses associated with channels. Moving to more recent history, the human influence on the site. Prior to colonization, the site was home to the Wangal clan of the Aurora people. Following colonization, it was cleared for grazing and then reclaimed in two phases. Uh, the rec pre-reclamation environment can be seen on the left-hand clip. Salt marsh, sloping down to mangroves, mud flats, and an estuary on the right-hand side. It was reclaimed in two phases. First in the early 1900s, second in the 1950s. Between these two phases of reclamation, a north-south channel developed through the site. And then towards the tail end, it was, there was imported fill brought onto the site to surcharge all of the, the dredged fill. This happened from the north, traveling you know, down south through the site, and you can see a clip of the environment on the right-hand side. As a result of these human activities on site, bit of a dodgy button there. As a result of the human activities on site, there's two distinct deposits. The first is the dredged fill from the land reclamation. This is, and this may sound familiar, a silty clay, dark gray, soft, firm trace shells, and sand lenses. And this was locally sourced in many cases, as you can see from the, as you saw from the clip of the site and the adjacent estuary from as little as a few hundred meters away. Overlying this is the imported fill, gravel, clay gravel with uh, various inclusions. So, as a result of the desktop study, which covered two historical ground investigations and built detailed conceptual models about how the sediments on this, on this site had been developed. We identified the pea soup as a key risk to design. Bit of a shocker, that one. And we scoped a specialized additional ground investigation, focusing on these soft sediments. In historical ground investigation, there was a lot of call loss through them. There was very poor understanding of their behavior and their extent. So this additional ground investigation that we scoped with myself on site, supervising works on my hands and knees in the mud, logging the sonic boreholes, um, was comprised of three methods. Sonic boreholes, cone penetrometers, and seismic dilatometers. In three locations, cluster one, two, and three, we, we clustered these intrusive investigations together so we could compare and contrast the results of the in-situ testing and the visual and tactile logging. Once we'd completed our ground investigation, the next step was to build our geological model. Now, our preliminary model was a draw a line between the contacts and the boreholes exercise. We didn't have a lot of insight to the in-situ testing, so we focused on the results of the visual and tactile logging of those sonic boreholes because we had the most confidence in that information. It was comprised of four, four units, as you can see on the right-hand side, imported fill, overlying dredged fill. Quite easy to tell these apart. Clear change in lithology, clear change in consistency. Same with Holocene clay down to Pleistocene clays. Now, clear change in consistency, clear change in lithology. The problem comes in at the boundary between the dredged fill and the Holocene clay. I'll drill down into the similarities and the differences in these two units. So the dredged fill, as I mentioned, locally sourced, has the exact same component parts as the underlying material. You'd think there's a consistency change, but there really isn't as they've both been heavily loaded by the imported fill, the overlying uh, warehouses, freight, trucks, and the human influence on the site. But the difference between these two materials is critical. The dredged fill was placed chaotically in a high energy environment in geological terms yesterday. It has very little structure at a microscopic scale, whereas the Holocene clay that's been deposited slowly, naturally, over thousands of years in a natural environment has much more structure, behaves very differently, and is much less prone to settlement. Now, the uncertainty in the boundary between these two materials, and I mean this was plus minus meters, um, led to massive over-conservatism in design. We had very little understanding about where this boundary was, and this drove conversations around the office like, potentially we need to apply the worst case parameters to this entire volume of soil. That led to other discussions like, maybe we need to micropile all the culverts. So as the person building the geological model, this made me look quite hard at the site history. How can I guide my interpretation? How can I quantify my conceptual model? And how can I bring that in to, to guide my interpretation? The surface that we're looking for, the boundary between natural and artificial materials, functionally the historical ground surface. We know we added some material and that sunk a little bit. It's there somewhere. We just need to work out exactly where. If we can work out where the historical ground level is, as it's settled, everything above this level must be artificial with a high certainty. If we can work out with some back of the envelope calculations where it's settled down to, everything below this must be 
natural material with a high certainty. And we know what the surface used to look like. Salt marsh, sloping down to mangroves, mud flats, and an estuary on the right-hand side. I can picture it. So where's our point of commonality between our conceptual model, our understanding, and our site in four dimensions? For me, for this project, it was environments. The mangroves. These will typically only grow in a particular tidal range between spring tide and sea level. You'll have mud flats below mean sea level, and river will be mapped at the low tide level. So we can correlate these environments back to tidal levels. We can go back and research the historical tidal levels within the Sydney Harbour, adjust them for sea level rise, and some changes in datums. And with board strokes, we can draw contours across our site. We've reconstructed the pre-reclamation pre ground surface. With this pre-reclamation ground surface, some very conservative assumed loadings on the soil column, we can calculate sediment levels. We used two methods from Scott 1980, first with the results of seismic dilatometers and second with the results of odometers. And we did this in 3D, well, I did this in 3D, across the site, across the surrounding area, and here we see those in section. The black dotted line is the historical ground surface. Everything above this must be dredged fill, and we have a high confidence on that volume of soil. Three sediment levels, the lowest of which is red, this is a very conservative assumed lowest sediment level with a CC of 0.2. Everything below this must be natural material with a high certainty. And at this point, we could feed that lower bound back into design, could tell the designers, we know how deep the pea soup is, go and design your culverts. But I wanted to take a step further. I wanted to prove that it's appropriate for us to take that lower bound. And I did this by looking at the behavior of each of these volumes of soil, calculated seven parameters, split out by cohesive and granular to account for the inherent differences in behavior. Now, and of course, compare these for dredged fill, potential fill, and Holocene clay. A number of them showed absolutely no relationship, and there's no surprises there. However, a number showed a clear gradational relationship, and the, these almost sit in the majority. This is where the potential fill envelope behaves halfway between dredged fill and the underlying natural material. This shows that the boundary is, does sit somewhere within there, and the potential fill holds a little bit of both. Taking it a step further, a number show a clear relationship. Potential fill and dredged fill behave the same way, and the underlying Holocene clay is quite distinct. And this, this shows that it's appropriate for us to adopt that lower bound and feed that back into design. So we'll take a step back. We'll review the model development. What does this actually mean for design? And then I've got some closing remarks that hopefully we can all take away back to our day-to-day -day work. So we went from a preliminary model this was a draw a line between contacts and a borehole exercise. Had very low certainty. We we're applying parameters to an entire volume of soft soil with low confidence. We then took our understanding of the site history. We quantified it. We brought it into our site in four dimensions. We found a point of commonality, and we developed domains of high and low certainty. We then looked at the behavior of each of those volumes and proved that it's appropriate for us to adopt the lower bound. We can now apply our, our parameters to a discrete domain, a discrete volume of soil with confidence. And what does the geometry change mean? So we can now apply our parameters with confidence, but at its thickest, I refined this boundary by two meters. This meant the pea soup halved in thickness alongside applying parameters with confidence. This meant, well, some of those conversations around the office changed from do we need a micropile or culverts to no micropiles around here. So some discussion points. What can we learn from this? This case study shows a quantifiable, tangible advantage to understanding your site's history and then applying it. I like this graph on the right-hand side from Fuchs 1997. It shows typical uh, geology well done, geology less well done, and then typical geotechnical data acquisition. The total geological model, total geological history model framework and using this model we can have a fantastic understanding of what our potential site conditions are before we even leave the office. Take that a step further. How do we actually apply this understanding? It's critical that when we scope our ground investigation, we use that range of potential conditions on site, all the outputs from our conceptual models, and we target our methodology, we target our locations, and we target our lab testing on what we might encounter. Like a quote, if you're not looking for something, you're never going to find it. Then my last point, I've got a couple of slides to expand out on this. Embed the conceptual model in your geological model. We can shift from the unknowns between our boreholes to the knowns between our boreholes. We should have a range of conditions, and here's a you know, conceptual, maybe we have a fault on site. But 
it's important for us to not just model with the results of ground investigation. We, result, we model or develop our understanding and interpretation of a site with the results of our desktop study, ground investigation, and our conceptual model. And it's very easy in modern modeling programs like LeapFrog to start creating surfaces between contacts and boreholes. However, as we saw with the preliminary model, this can be misleading. It implies confidence when we might not have it, and it can just be plain wrong. So a bit of a challenge to everyone doing interpretation for sites, building geological models. If there is an uncertainty in your model, quantify and address it. Where are you certain? And if you're uncertain, where is that uncertainty coming from? Is it lack of data? Is it conflicting data? Provide maximum and minimum potential levels. This allows us to have an informed discussion with designers about uncertainty, about where conservatism should lie in our designs, and critically, provides justification for scoping additional ground investigation, which we so often miss out on. Ultimately, this will drive appropriate, efficient, environmentally friendly design. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.